Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome along to the vlog. Monday morning, after the weekend where we opened on the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, anyway. All I can say is, I came out on Friday and Saturday. And I think that I need to have uh, kidney dialysis for the rest of my days now. Yeah, that's how bad it actually was this morning. The back pain. Unbelievable. Easy to say, I definitely overindulged. Anywho, we're back in work. I'm alright, really. It was a great weekend, actually. And we were very busy, and uh, it's a shame we're having to turn people away because we can't fit them in. So, yeah, in this week, uh, tasks for this week include, but are not limited to, starting to brew some beer. I should have came down yesterday. Well, I did come down yesterday. I forgot to turn the HLT on, so we're not going to be brewing today. Um, but we will tomorrow. So we've got four batches of beer to brew this week. I've also set up the pilot kit, and uh, we've got some Firmzilla fermenters, or the all rounders, Kegland all rounders, 60 litre. So we've got something temperature controlled and a little bit more aesthetically pleasing to ferment the beer in. We also need to label all the proof of concept and vacant cans that we did a couple of weeks ago. They're now ready, I've tested them, they're great and they're ready to go back on the web store. Meaning that you'll be able to order them again. And then next week we're going to do some experiments with some fruit beers and some sours. And that's what the pilot kit's coming out for ultimately. But today, that's all in the future, today I have got myself a kilo of natural raw but filtered beeswax and it's local stuff as well okay so British beeswax and I've also got myself a new apron for brewing so let's have a look at the apron and let's have a look what I'm doing with the beeswax well how does that look so this is a crafty little apron not quite a penny and uh, it's made out of canvas if you like or denim or whatever you want to call it anyway it's quite a heavy cloth as you can see and we want to waterproof it for when I get splashes and whatnot on there while I'm brewing so I've got my piece of natural beeswax and I'm using it like a wax crayon and we're just rubbing the wax onto the cloth. So I imagine you'd do this if you had a wax jacket or something like that along those lines. And the idea is we want to impregnate the cloth with just enough wax to make it water repellent but not too much so we're not walking around carrying a kilogram of wax around our necks. But it's relatively simple, so if I just fly along this bottom section, and you can see the colour change immediately once we've got the wax on there. And then we're going to do something different so it doesn't just look like this. Because it looks a bit rough and ropey at the minute. And you might have already spotted the heat gun in the background. And that is the next stage so the bottom is going to be where any drips run to to come off so we'll make sure we've got a good amount of wax down here this is going to be the worst area I'd have thought and then around the top of the pockets where my hands will be going in kind of thing so there we go and the next job excuse the noise heat gun now, watch this. So there we go, and as you can see, 
So we've got darker patches and lighter patches. So I'm just going to run over this again, top to bottom, just to make sure that we've got wax in all the crevices between the cloth. And one more heat treatment and then that should be it. So I'll just uh, save you the time of watching it happen twice. And then we'll go and see if it's water repellent or not by putting some water on it. Voila! Transformation complete. Let's get some water and see if indeed it is water repellent. Oh yes, look at that. Just bounces straight off the material. A little bit of penetration, but certainly for, for splashes and all that kind of thing, I reckon we can see the water just beads off. Look at it just rolling straight off the material. Wonderful. Well, there we go. I've now got a waterproof apron for brew day. But how does it look? Is it crafty enough for you? I think so. Somewhere for pens, somewhere for a tape measure, another pocket for other things, and a logo which I'll probably get rid of and replace with one of these. So here's a view you've not seen before. Look at them two beauties. So here we have two Firmzilla all-rounders, 60 litre with the cooling coils inside and the pressure tops. So we're going to get a under counter chiller underneath this table so we can keep both of these units cold during fermentation. But they look smart. So we're getting everything cleaned down for brew day tomorrow. Gemma's cleaning up there a little bit. A little bit washed out up there, love, with light behind you. And, well, the way we empty the mash tun during brew day involves tipping it to one side. And of course there are no feet on any of these tanks. They're just, uh, they're just the ends of the pipe that we cut for, for feet. So I need to come up with a solution to prevent damage to the resin floor as we tip this over every day to clean it out. And it occurred to me that most plant has HDPE adjustable feet on the bottom of them. And uh, whilst I could wait and order some, HDPE is readily available in the supermarkets as chopping boards. This is about five millimeters thick, which I think is going to be more than enough. And instead of welding on a solid base plate to the tanks and then trying to thread screws and stuff in there, I think what I'm going to do is just cut a circle out of wood, which is the size of the internal diameter of the of the leg. And we'll screw this to the wood, and the wood can slide up inside the tube, a tight fit too, hopefully holding this on the base. So let's have a play with it, see if we can get it to work. So I've got a sheet of 18mm plier and off cut. I'm going to stick this on the top here and draw around it on the inside, and I'll use that for my template for cutting a few more of them out. And then we'll just reduce it overall diameter with the uh, sander a little bit and then we'll cut some discs as well from the HDPE screw them to the ply and then yeah hopefully the ply work as an insert the HDPE being slightly bigger will work as a foot and friction fit should hold them in place
half an hour later and we've got four lovely looking perfectly fitted HDPE legs this is just a little bit of plastic I've uh, hit the edges with a flat disc just so they fit the profile of the steel and this is just what what's left on it but as you can see it's just it's just rubbing off so I'm not worried about cleaning that off at all probably come off with the hose pipe over the next week or so but I'm pleased with them so let's turn it upside down and see how they actually uh, stand up to the floor and there we have it the only drawback is these feet are now quite slippery on the floor so when we tip the mash tun over to dig it out I think it's going to slip and slide across the way so we're going to have to figure out a way to prevent that happening or figure out a new way of digging the mash tun out oh, right next job and this is the last one of the set of fermenters this lid leaks and that's because it's too thick this section here go on Gem, just get it out this section here is too thick so it doesn't uh, sit properly probably <laughs> probably <laughs> <laughs> probably on the top of the tank so we're going to take 10 15 mil off the edge of this lid and then we have to stick on the inside some double sided uh, some single sided neoprene foam and then some some plumber's uh, plumber's gold silicone which we've got up there So Jem's just finished getting all the tanks ready for tomorrow's brew and all I need to do really is pull out the grain and get that, excuse me for the bumpy ride, get the grain into the tank ready for tomorrow. But I've got another little job to do, it's only three o'clock so I'm in no rush as of yet to go anywhere. Everyone's been asking where are the tilts on the last brew because you've noticed a lot of the viewers from the channel have noticed we don't have the big TV up on the wall. We're still using the tilts. The telly's packed up. So this is a sharp LC32DH500 LCD colour TV. 104 watts, 50 hertz and it's got a blinking red light on the front. It starts up for like five minutes and it goes into standby mode. It has a blinking red light and a blinking amber light, then a blinking green light, then it goes back to the red light again and it cycles between all three and having a look on the old gargler uh, they've informed me that that is a board fault and the TV is going into standby mode to protect itself. In fact, with that extra flashing light, they call it protection mode, which makes perfect sense if you ask me. So, we're going to have a look. This is Stuart's old TV, so I'm not actually all that bothered if we have to bin it. I'd rather not, of course. Um, but it's old but it was free so you know there is that benefit there and there's always a screw in the scarf side job is so if we have to chuck it and get a new one we will do but if I can just open her up and have a look if indeed there are any blown caps or anything like that then I'll, I'll try and give it a fix if we can so this is our power board this is our uh, signal board if you like and then over here They are the independent 
power controllers by the looks of it for separate strips of LEDs. Probably can't see over there. So what I'm guessing we've got here, and uh, don't take this as gospel, is one, two, three, four, five separate PSUs, probably four LED strips which are running from one side to the other to backlight the display and power control board and then signal processing board with all of the analog and digital inputs on there TV aerial input and all that kind of jazz and then ribbon cables running everywhere else this has got buttons on it so that's the uh, HMI the human machine interface two speakers which we're not using in this particular mode and then this is the chassis for the stand so all we can look for really is anything that looks suspicious on the uh, power supply board so if I can just get myself a pick yeah we do We've got one here look and I'll just lift up the little tabs yeah so we've just got a control chip on the other side there we go little brain box in there then we've got some other supporting circuitry lots and lots of it and we've got 5 volts 12 volts 6.5 volts all out and uh, 24 volts ground over this side but again there's a little bit of a dark area there I don't know if you can make that out that could be a problem zone so if we have a look on the back we can see that it's close to this what could be a transformer some diodes there and that looks like some type of 6 pin, 8 pin chip capacitor hmm I'm not 100% sure they look like Xena diodes transistor big resistor there maybe that's no that's not the cause of the heat I don't know I might have a poke around with a probe, oh yeah so just on those legs there there's a little scorch mark on the back of this component a little white speck and these leads here are dark brown so J109 that could be the culprit anyway enough of that waffle boys and girls probably can't fix this uh, with my limited knowledge so new screen it's gonna have to be but in the meantime I can still chuck the tilts in the tanks I just have to monitor it, to monitor it with my mobile phone or the laptop or the computer upstairs which is all connected to it it broadcasts to pretty much everything pretty cool And that's it for the day. We've got the timer set on the control panel, six o'clock in the morning. By the time I get here at about nine, probably tomorrow, half eight, nine o'clock. 
that water will be up to about 79 degrees C we'll mash in we'll start to put some acid into FV1 or at least rinse it I don't need to start doing that until well past lunch time when we're close to the end of the boil because this beer doing the proof tomorrow it's got obviously a 30 minute whirlpool steep so when I start the whirlpool steep that's when I can start the acidification of the fermenter to sanitize it There's no point doing it before two reasons why there's no point doing it before one you're leaving it longer so it could get re inoculated with anything floating around in the air and two there is a brass bushing in the CIP pumps which I've shown you before so why leave acid sat in the pump all day we'll just put acid in when we need it and when we're finished we'll rinse it out and your pump will last a year or so longer win win but uh, I think looking at the weather you can see it's nice out the windows there I might just go around to the beer garden and have a pint we are closed though so it'll just be me and you I suppose before I go I'll just show you the uh, Firmzilla setup that we've got going on I managed to get a gas line and a rag hooked up so look at the te the temp I nearly said the pressure gauge there look at the pressure gauge there that was turned off there we go I moved when I turned it back on but this was given 10 psi as was this one it's been sat here all day not moved as you can hear it it's tight as a drum I cannot wait to get those filled with beer don't they look the part still never managed to get the chiller out but we might do that tomorrow we've got well over a week to do that and then also just as one of the final things we'll do this week we'll just put all of the components onto the pilot kit give her a run through with some cleaning fluids and uh, oh yeah the controller for it well it is up there but I think we've got one naturally near the fermenters yeah you can just see it hanging on the wall up that blue 16 amp single phase feed that'll do us right then beer garden ahoy Oh, what do you reckon to that one, chaps? This is what I reckon to it. <sighs> Cheers, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I will catch you on the friggin' next one. Look at that video. All day. Just sit here all day. I kid you not. Let's get the boats in. Anyway, see you tomorrow. Cheers.